So thank you all so much for coming today. I'm Jennifer Gunn. I'm the director of the Institute for Advanced Study. And I'd like to open today's event by uh, recognizing that the land we are on is the homeland of the Dakota people. And the IAS acknowledges that we are newcomers to this land and we respect this land and this, and this place uh, and the uh, honor in the Dakota and Ojibwe nations of Minnesota. And we should all be remembering this every time that this is where the university sits. Um, so welcome to the first IAS Thursday of the, of the fall semester of 2018-2019. And uh, generally speaking, IAS Thursdays take place weekly at 3.30 p.m., 3.30 to 5. This semester we will be up here in Best Buy a number of times, but we are generally on the second floor on the east side of the building in the Crosby Seminar Room. If you would like to sign up for a weekly announcement of all IAS upcoming events, there is a sign-up sheet outside uh, on the table here. Uh, next week, our oops. Next week, our speaker it will be Amelia McNamara, who's a new faculty member at St. Thomas, and she will be talking about how spatial polygons shape the world, geometry, data, and perceptions of truth. This is part of the Human in the Data uh, series, which is a partnership or collaboration of, the, of DASH, the library's Digital Art Sciences and Humanities Unit, Research Computing, and other units on campus. Uh, we also have upcoming an event called Mapping 1968, Conflict and Change. It's a workshop run by uh, Use Spatial, and it'll take place on Friday morning, September 28th. Uh, the information is on the IAS website and this 1968 website, and we'd really like people to register for the September 28th event. Uh, this website represents an exciting partnership this year uh, between Northrop, the University Honors Program, and the IAS, and many, many other groups on campus uh, around the themes of 1968-69. And today's panel is the first, not just in the IAS Thursday series for the year, but also in the 1968-69 series. So I'm going to turn to talk more about that and introduce the series. I'm going to turn the program over to Matt Bribitzer Stull, the director of the University Honors Program, and then to Carrie Schloner, the director of Northrop. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm Matt Bribitzer Stull, Director of the University Honors Program and Professor of Music Theory. And as Jennifer mentioned, this is the first in a series of six Northrop Lecture Series events. And I wanted to tell you what the other five are because we're really excited about them and feel that this year's season is going to be just terrific. So coming up on Thursday, October 11th, right here, is our talk on American justice. We have Nancy Gertner from Harvard Law and Leisha Brooks from the Southern Poverty Law Center in dialogue, uh, moderated by Professor of History Elaine Tyler May. And they'll be speaking about um, the Civil Rights Act and uh, its legacy over the last 50 plus years. Um, on Thursday, November 8th, 3.30, here again, campus protests, representation, and educational reform. We have two University of Minnesota faculty members, John Wright, African and African American Studies, and Jean O'Brien, American Indian Studies, joining Lena Jones of Hecua to talk about the student protests here on the University of Minnesota campus 50 years ago and how they changed our curriculum. And then Thursday, February 21st, here again, 3.30, We'll have Roger Launius, who's a former historian for NASA, talking about the space race and both the science and the politics behind what was going on between the Soviet Union and the US in the Cold War and how that led to putting a man on the moon. Thursday, April 11th, here again, 3.30 p.m., Dreamscape, uh, UC Riverside professor Ricker B. Hines will be, having, uh, will be coming to perform his two-person show and then to speak about it on the lecture series. And that show investigates the complex relationship between police forces and communities of color over the past decades. And then finally, different time and place, 7 p.m. in the main Northrop Theater at uh, Thursday, April 18th, 
will be Carol Anderson, who's professor at Emory University and New York Times bestselling author of the book White Rage, and she'll be talking about backlashes to African American advancement in the uh, United States since the Emancipation Procla Proclamation, excuse me, um, but focusing on the last 50 years in particular. And then um, I have a couple logistic announcements. So as director of the honors program, I'm delighted to say this is the third year that we've been running a co-curricular experience for honors students, which we call a nexus experience around the lecture series. Those students are not only attending these talks, but doing some readings beforehand. Um, students have a chance to go out for dinner with our speakers. So those of you students who are on tonight's dinner, if you needed a ride for me, look for, where is Susanna Smith? Look for Susanna Smith at the end of the lecture Q&A and she will guide you down to where I will be waiting with my car and we'll um, enjoy dinner with the speakers and guests. And then those who are not going to dinner at, six, at 6.30, we will reconvene in Nolte Lounge. If you're going to dinner, I'll make sure you get there because I'll be there too for an hour of discussion about tonight's, uh, tonight's talk. I think that's all for me, so without further ado, I'll introduce Carrie Schloner, director of Northrop. Thanks, Grant. It is my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of Northrop. We just couldn't be more thrilled to uh, partner with the Institute for Advanced Study and the University Honors Program on this series. Matt, you did a great job of outlining the series, so I'm just gonna highlight a couple other events that are upcoming here at Northrop. Next week, we have Angela Davis on the 19th um, as part of the Power and Privilege series. And then the following week on the 27th, we have Dan Butner talking about his Blue Zones. And then on October 4th, uh, Northrop is kicking off our um, 1819 dance series with Ballet Hispanico. So we hope you can join us for those. We have some great discounts for faculty, staff, and students. And uh, you can talk to someone at the box office about those. And we do have some materials out in the lobby. So. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Okay, thank you. I want to introduce our, our panelists for today. And uh, then after I do the introduction, we're going to show a short film clip to sort of set the mood and remind us about 1968. Um, our panelists uh, just happen to be uh, related to key figures in 1968. Mary Beth Yer McCarthy Yarrow was a 19-year-old college student in 1968 when she determined that her educational goals were secondary to moral principles. And, and when her uncle, Eugene McCarthy, decided to challenge Lyndon Johnson for the presidency over the issue of American involvement in the Vietnam War, she left school to volunteer for McCarthy's campaign and go, quote, clean for Jean. Uh, Mary Beth began her professional film production career in 1980 with the documentary The Wilmer Eight, the story of eight women who formed a union and walked off their jobs as, bank, as bookkeepers and tellers at the Citizens National Bank in the first bank strike in U.S. history. Happened in Wilmer, Minnesota. Her latest documentary, Jean McCarthy, Alone in the Land of the Aardvarks, is due to be released in fall of 2018, and that's where our film clip will come from. Bill Howard is the nephew of former Senator Hubert Humphrey, the former Minnesota senator who was the architect of many of America's most significant civil rights and social policies as Lyndon Baines Johnson's vice president in the 1960s. Senior Judge Howard received his BA in political science from the University of Minnesota. We have a lot of U of M alumni here today, I'm very happy to say. And he received his, uh, in 1969, he got his BA and he ob obtained his law degree here as well in 1971. He has served as an assistant attorney general with the Minnesota Attorney General's Office for nearly 20 years. As, a, as Special Assistant Attorney General for the Minnesota Department of Commerce and Minnesota Department of Labor and Industry, and as Assistant Commissioner of Insurance for the Minnesota Department of Commerce. He was appointed to the Hennepin County District Court in 1990, then elected to the bench in 1992, and re-elected three more times. After retiring in 2013, he accepted an appointment at, in 2017 to serve statewide as senior judge. 
Our moderator today may also be familiar to, to some of you. He is John Rash, and he's an editorial writer and columnist for the Minneapolis Star Tribune. His weekly Rash Report column analyzes media news and trends, and his analysis can be heard weekly on WCCO AM and the, quote, Playing Politics podcast. John was the recipient of a 2014 Society of Professional Journalists Page One Award for editorial writing. Prior to joining the Star Tribune's editorial board, he was a senior vice president and director of media analysis for Campbell Mithen, a Minneapolis-based national advertising agency. John is also a graduate of the University of Minnesota and has been an adjunct faculty member at the university's Hubbard School of Journalism and Mass Communication. So we're gonna have a panel, John's gonna be the moderator. We'll try to kind of wind up the panel about 4.30 so that we have about half an hour for questions and answers from all of you. And now we'll start with a brief film clip and then call our panelists to the front. Nineteen sixty-eight was a very tragic year for this country, but that year began with the candidacy of an anti-war senator by the name of Eugene McCarthy. At each stage of Vietnam, our involvement became deeper and the people running the war didn't know what they were doing. Someone had to challenge the president. We were looking for someone who would run on that issue. Gene came in because nobody else would do it. I intend to enter the Democratic primary. The movement that had always been in the grassroots rallied behind him. We've come all the way out here because we believe so strongly in Senator McCarthy. This guy started with nothing except the people. Something is really happening in America. We are going to defeat an incumbent president of the United States. I am announcing today my candidacy. He had a chance. I was supporting Gene till the end. With Kennedy button in, that's going to be bad. This is Paul Newman speaking. This is Tony Rand. This is Lauren Bacall. This is Dustin Hoffman. Vote for Senator Eugene McCarthy. McCarthy. Lower class workers did not respond as well to McCarthy's more intellectual approach to politics. My thanks to all of you, and now it's on to Chicago, and let's win there. Senator Kennedy has been shot. Is that possible? No. Oh, my God. Kennedy. Senator Kennedy has been shot. This year, 1968, is the moment of truth for America. If this effort fails, many people, particularly the young people, will lose whatever faith they have left now. It could be a wonderful age for our children to grow up in, and it just looks very hopeless. I think we knew McCarthy would not be the Democratic nominee, but we also knew that you couldn't give up. He is our last hope in 1968. That man is Gene McCarthy. After the 1968 campaign, he felt very alienated. I am alone in the land of the aardvarks. I am walking east. All the aardvarks are going west. It haunts me to this day that I did not listen carefully enough when he was walking west alone. I want to replicate that. I want to mobilize citizens from every generation. We have a kind of political confusion. There were times when he disappointed us, but he never betrayed us. He once said, the greatest danger to this nation is stupidity. Most delegates to this convention do not know that thousands of young people are being beaten in the streets of Chicago. Broken things are powerful, but things about to break are stronger still. This is a new kind of politics. Politics of reason, of trust. And if we succeed, as I'm sure we shall, it'll be a different kind of America. Thank you very much for that generous introduction for all of us, and thank you especially for being here today. And it's an incredible honor to be back on, at my alma mater. Um, this is actually the second time this week I had the great opportunity to moderate a panel 
with um, historian Elaine Tyler May, who was mentioned briefly, and I believe she is here today as well. And she was so terrific that uh, NPR is going to broadcast that conversation this coming Monday at noon and at 9 o'clock. And I think part of what made the dialogue so compelling were some terrific questions from people in the audience. So as mentioned, we're going to get to those as quickly as possible. But I want to start off with some questioning and thank you both very much for being here. And you know, I, I know that in the introduction and in the reasoning why, why so many people showed up today, you know, they're aware of, of your relationship and association you know, with, with your uncles here. But if you could just briefly delve into it a little bit deeper to give us some background. In that year of 1968, you know, what was your role, however official or unofficial, and, and how close were you to these extraordinarily historical campaigns? Yes, thank you. Am I on? Um, but uh, first, I just want to take a moment to say that um, um, Jean had once said that perhaps some thought should be given to amending the Fourth Commandment to include uncle as um, a biblical place of honor. <laughs> so I, I sit here today um, as I do honor my mother and I do honor my father. I feel that it is a privilege for Bill and me to be here today to honor these uncles, um, Hubert Horatio Humphrey and Eugene Joseph McCarthy. So I just, you know, I just want to acknowledge that. Um, I, like Alice in Wonderland, um, was sort of sitting by the shores of Eagle Lake in Wilmer, Minnesota, um, pondering my life. And the Jean McCarthy campaign jumped through the rabbit hole that was in front of me. And um, I, I did not... Um, as Jennifer said, uh, feel this moral obligation. It was really more as the board here for the, advan the Institute of Advanced Studies says, um, uh, is it dare to discover? <laughs> and um, I, like Alice, followed um, the white rabbit of Jean McCarthy down into that rabbit hole and um, I, like Alice, entered a political wonderland, and my life was changed uh, forever. My father was Jean's younger brother. Uh, he was the first resident trained surgeon uh, to go to Wilmer, Minnesota, uh, trained here at the University of Minnesota. And as the first resident trained surgeon, my father did the surgery for Wilmer, Appleton, Benson, Painesville, Olivia, Sock Center, he was a very busy man. And um, our family was not political. We were really apolitical or non-political. Um, we were raised with a sense of ethic and a sense of morality. But um, there was not time um, or it was not brought into our family discussion. So I came to the McCarthy campaign as one of those people I can't even say I got clean for Jean. I, I, I got awakened um, for Jean. And because my name was McCarthy, I was sent to Wisconsin. Um, Jean had won the New Hampshire primary, and the campaign had moved to Wisconsin. And I had this time before I was going to come go back to school that was free. And I called the office in St. Paul, and I said, may I come down and, I don't know, stuff envelopes. I thought I would be useful in some way. And because I had the name McCarthy, because the campaign was going on in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, I was sent there and um, was sent out into these coffee groups and small groups because that was the way the campaign worked at the time. It was really a uh, grassroots movement. Um, initially, they had to send someone along with me who could talk about the issues. Um, I was gregarious, I was gracious, I was um, you know, pleasant and appealing, but I really was ill-informed. And it became, um, my, became my university. 
I, I learned through the school of hard knocks and I learned quickly and, and it changed my life forever. Um, it opened my eyes, it opened my awareness. Um, I met my future husband on the campaign trail and, um, and here I am now 50 years later as a documentary filmmaker trying to finish a film that I started some 30 years ago. Uh, to give uh, life, um, uh, to give the life and legacy of Jean McCarthy um, a grounding. Well, that really manifests Dare to Discover, so that's a terrific <laughs> background, so thank you very much. And, and Judge Howard, similar question. Um, with the campaign at that time, however formal and informal, what was your role? It was more informal because I was a full-time student at the university and I was graduating in the spring of 68, um, and going on to law school. I did do some <laughs> events. I went to Detroit um, and tried to give a speech, but I was a lot more tongue-tied in those days. I started law school, but the Humphrey family has always been pretty close. My mother was Hubert's younger sister, and um, she was a political animal of her own, and I, I remember 1960 going to Wisconsin and staying in the Kaiser Knickerbocker Hotel and being on the there was a bus, we went around western Wisconsin, um, Muriel dishing up coffee, and uh, it, it was retail politics. Um, I, was, I was very involved in the 1970 campaign, because that was my third year of law school, mm -hmm. and it was a peak experience of my life working with Hubert, um, and um, working with, I worked with the volunteers, and I did every parade and every county fair, and, and it was a great, it was a very good summer and fall. My wife worked with me, n my now wife worked with me also in that campaign. And, um, but in 68, I attended the convention. Um, we, we had family gatherings periodically, um, but I was not um, as aware of the issues as I was in 1969 and 70. 1968 was a year of unbelievable fracture. Mm -hmm. I mean, it wasn't just Martin Luther King pe being assassinated. It was Bob Bobby Kennedy being assassinated. It was, there were a couple hundred riots between 67 and 68. The cities um, were burning. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people were very angry. And the Vietnam War started, it really started escalating in 65. But by 68, the, the students were coalescing in, around politics, and there was a major battle um, in the state of Minnesota, which was a caucus state as opposed to a primary state, and the uh, McCarthy people took over Hennepin County with two law students, Vance Opperman and Howie Keibel, and um, Vance is still here, um, and they literally took over the entire um, county um, apparatus and that wasn't, that wasn't too popular with uh, the Humphrey faction. Um, the state convention was um, very, very contentious, and the district conventions were contentious. Um, the war was ramping up, but it, it had a lot to do with, on campus, the, what we were all, the men were all worried about getting drafted, and the standards for the draft were changing that year. So originally, if you were in graduate school, or you were married, or you had kids and were married, or you're in undergraduate school, you were deferred. But the draft calls began to increase. Draft calls mean you are involuntarily compelled by the government to go in the military for at least two years, and you have a great chance of going to Vietnam. Um, that got people's attention a lot more than we do now with the wars in Afghanistan, where they're all volunteers. Mm -hmm. But um, McCarthy was the one who, the only one who was willing to challenge Johnson. Um, and he got 43% of the vote in February of, or February or March, I don't know the exact date of the New Hampshire primary, and he, um, he really forced Johnson out. But, I mean, Johnson got 48%, but McCarthy, the, I can remember the kids get clean for Gene. Everybody had long hair and all that. You know, they shaved it off, they wore nice clothes, they went up, um, a lot of the colleges around Boston um, would be would be empty of students from Thursday through Sunday because they would go up and door knock and talk to people. So that was kind of, um, we knew the thing was changing. We didn't know Johnson was going to quit. Um, 
and we didn't know Martin Luther King was going to be shot, and we didn't know that Bobby Kennedy was going to be shot. And the year, um, it was a year that is much worse than now. Everybody thinks it's terrible with Trump, but it was, everybody was very upset, and they were in the streets. heard from Judge Howard a reference to the convention in Chicago and, of course, from the really compelling footage that you uh, shared with us today, you know, in an incredibly chaotic year that was the crescendo of it. And I wonder if you, I wanted to know if you could please share your perception of the convention, both inside the convention hall and I think what's often underplayed with the public, the chaos that was happening inside there, and then, of course, the much more famous and the searing images of what was happening outside the convention in Grant Park with the protesters. Well, um, yes, I, 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 n I don't remember ever going into the convention hall. Um, we were staying in the Hilton Hotel, um, Senator McCarthy's headquarters, and I think Senator Humphreys, mm. uh, Vice President Humphreys' headquarters were also at the Hilton yep. Hotel. And, um, and across the street from the Hilton Hotel was Grant Park. And um, leading up to the convention, the, the factions that were there were students, McCarthy students. There were um, uh, the, 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 um, the more radical fringe groups, the yippies, yippies. and the yuppies, and the, the yippies were there. And, and there were people who, they were people who came to really disrupt the convention. They, they, as Jean said somewhere, really wanted, they wanted something to happen. Um, I, I, I would have to say that a lot of the McCarthy supporters, although they were in the streets, were probably not a part of, of that. But it was riotous. And I saw in a documentary called Chicago 1968, they filmed an interview that Roy Wilkins had with um, the, the mayor of Chicago, Richard Daley at the time. And the, 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 the yippies had come wanting to get a permit mm -hmm. to demonstrate. Mm -hmm. And Roy Wilkins tells of as he was talking to Daly, saying, if you don't give these permits, there's going to be blood in the streets. And he said that he saw the red, the expression watching somebody's blood boil, come out of the white collar of Mayor Daly's shirt as he sl banged his hand on the table and saying, there will not be permits and there will not be demonstrations mm -hmm. in my city. And as the Kerner commission who studied what happened in Chicago said basically it was a police riot mm -hmm. and um, that Daly had his Chicago police out in force he had called in the National Guard um, we stood um, on the sidewalk lining the sidewalk between the Hilton Hotel and Grant Park were the National Guard and they had bayonets mm -hmm the end of their rifles. We don't know whether the rifles were loaded or not, but there were certainly bayonets. And, um, and as well, there were Jeeps. Again, you saw in the footage, there were these Jeeps that had barbed wire on the front that were all lined up on the street. Um, and, and it was, it was a war zone. And, and, but oddly enough, I mean, I these are the, the stories I, Inside of the Hilton Hotel was a takeout counter. And standing in line at the takeout counter would be a Chicago policeman who had come to get coffee and donuts for some of his men. There were the yuppies who, yippies who had come over and were getting coffee and donuts. There were McCarthy people, and everybody was standing in line with deference, saying, oh, excuse me, please, no, go ahead waiting in line to be given coffee and donuts, and outside the war was raging. So it was that kind of Alice in Wonderland insanity that was going on. <laughs> and Kennedy was of course, with what was happening on the convention floor. And so, you know, when your uncle was eventually accepting mm -hmm. 
the nomination from the Democratic Party to be the next president of the United States, to what degree did you sense immediately that what was happening in the streets was going to take away from what might happen in his campaign? We knew it. Um, we knew it, and his, his speech was one of forgiveness and trying to go forward. He wasn't responsible for the, um, what the Chicago police did, um, but he, he was shackled with it, basically, by the public. Um, the only way to describe it, it was a police riot. They were looking for a fight. Mm -hmm. The Yippies were looking for a fight, and some of the, but not the ma vast majority of the students and other people that were in the park. They had bonfires, and they were out singing. When we were in the, um, when we were in the Hilton, um, we could smell tear gas, <laughs> mm -hmm. but we didn't know what was happening until afterwards. And when we were at the convention. Um, the newspaper people and the TV people were the ones telling us what was going on um, because there was no permit. Now, whether they would have abided by the permit is another matter. Mm -hmm. um, but Daly's attitude was um, almost like um, the 60s civil rights things in the early 60s where the police just beat the hell out of people. And they did, I mean, with batons. Mm -hmm. and truncheons and it was it was very violent and um, they also went after the media they beat some of them mm -hmm. some of the TV people and they got then got on and talked about what it was like mm -hmm. while they were running the convention footage and that had a that had a significant impact but there wasn't um, the convention was also late it was in late August mm -hmm. usually conventions are in July or late June so there was almost no time to recover um, Johnson as a matter of fact, toyed with the idea of coming out to the convention until the end of the second day, but the Secret Service told him it was not safe to land a helicopter on the top of the Hilton. He really hadn't given up wanting to run. Mm -hmm. um, it, um, but when we were in the Hilton, we could look out and see, but we also smelled tear gas. We knew there were problems, but the media, it's not like everybody had a cell phone then. Nobody had cell phones. Um, the media could communicate by things, but we were sort of, we were, we were always reacting. Um, and if you were in the Hilton, it, I know that Senator Humphrey tried to, wanted to go outside and talk to the demonstrators and the Secret Service refused to let him go. He said, it's just too dangerous. But if you listen to his speech, and at eight o'clock tonight on channel 17, they're rerunning the life of Hubert Humphrey. Mm -hmm. It's a two hour documentary and if you wanna know about him and, um, that'll be a good place, because he started really in the, in the 1940s as mayor of Minneapolis. It didn't, he didn't just happen, nor did Gene McCarthy just happen. Gene came up through the ranks in, in St. Paul and was a congressman from the St. Paul district. I don't know whether it was still the same number, but. It was, I think, fourth. Uh, fourth. Mm -hmm. um, and the party was formed, basically, and these, these were people that got along with each other. And so it was really a very traumatic experience, I think, both for Gene and for Hubert in 68 and trying to reconcile um, their friendship, but their, where they were positioned and what was going on. And Lyndon Johnson was um, not a figure to be toyed with. Mm -hmm. If you wanna read the Caro books, you can figure that out. He just didn't give in. Right, no, that w I wanted to, um, to, to sort of bring that to the attention too, that in 1948, 20 years before, it was really Hubert Humphrey um, who was the um, who was the Methodist Protestant mayor of Minneapolis and Jean McCarthy who represented sort of Irish Catholic St. Paul um, uh, economics professor at St. Thomas who brought together the 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 DFL the Democratic Farm and the Democratic Labor Party and it's was it is important to note that before that. Minnesota was a very Republican state because the Democratic vote was split between these factions. Mm -hmm. And it was these two men, along with Orville Freeman and Don Frazier and a couple Walter of others. Mondale. Walter mm -hmm. Well, Walter was young. He was a, he was, he, he was there. That's right. He was a, um, I think he was a student mm -hmm. um, assistant to Hubert at the time or yeah, something. Yeah, uh, Right. And, and, and Hubert was elected to the Senate and Gene was elected to Congress. 
And those men went to Washington for the 81st Congress, and they debated issues like universal health care, the civil rights movement. Um, they were, um, they were uh, champions of a lot of um, liberal causes and efforts, and, and they together really helped to develop the Democratic Farm Labor Party um, in that 20 years um, leading up to 1968. What, uh, I was going to describe there, um, you know, you had two Minnesotans who were thrust not just on the national but international stage mm -hmm. at a time of tremendous tension. To what degree did this split the Minnesota delegation of Democrats, not just at the convention but statewide, those that identified very heavily with the party? And how long did that linger here in the state? Well, I'd say um, it lingered for probably 20 to 30 years. It's still there to some extent. Um, um, Rudy Perpich became the lieutenant governor with Wendy Anderson in 1970 because the Nick Coleman faction, which was the peace faction, um, wanted, because Wendy Anderson had worked on Hubert's campaigns and worked with him, and that was a peace offering in the party, essentially. And then Perpich ended up being um, governor after uh, Wendell Anderson um, went on to the Senate. So, I mean, it was, the two factions were always there, but the Vietnam War um, was in the shadow of the Korean War. And the part of Johnson's response, it's not meant to be an excuse, but um, the Democrats were blamed for, quote, losing China. Mm -hmm. And that really wasn't accurate. Um, and the Korean War was a stalemate. And I think people in Johnson's generation of politicians um, did not want to be seen as um, losing a war. I mean, and when you look at the Vietnam War, and it went on until 1975, people do not realize it only ended when Congress defunded the war. Mm -hmm. Nixon and then Ford were ready to go and keep going. But the people, through the representatives, absolutely cut the money off. And that's how the war ended it. And we should. We have some parallels now because we have a seven-year war in Afghanistan and I don't know how many year war in, in Iraq and all these other places and um, the dead bodies aren't as, aren't as heavy. We were losing anywhere from 100 to 300 and then after Nixon was in it got up to 400 a week. People were getting killed over there um, and the country was incredibly divided um, and it, it was, uh, 68 was kind of the beginning of the cauldron. There were, there were demonstrations on the, on the George Washington by the monument in Washington where there were 20, 30, 40,000 kids. And then they walked over to the Pentagon too that same weekend. There were huge, huge demonstrations. That, but 68 was the catalyst where it all began. And um, I don't think there'd been those kind of demonstrations since World War I. Can we questions. I'm going to direct the first one to you, please, in, in terms of Judge Howard was talking about how the networks covered the convention and the Grant Park rides outside of it. And, you know, I'm sure in your film and, and for all of you who, you know, who um, remember back to those days or have studied those days, you know, the chant, the whole world is watching mm -hmm. was, you know, how so many Americans um, heard about, saw about, and, and learned about what was happening in Grand Park. Were this to happen today, yes, the whole world would be watching, but they'd also be tweeting and posting and Instagramming, and <laughs> we would be in a social media in environment here. And, and, you know, talk a little bit, if you will, just about the media environment then um, to, the, to the degree that, that it's different now and, and, you know, how you think things might be different in, in a very, with the, you know, transformative technology that we have in media today? Well, it, it was, it's hard for me to talk about the media coverage of it because I was in it. And, 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 and really in it. I mean, I, I, I started in Wisconsin and, and I then went right on to Indiana for the in Indiana primary and to um, uh, Nebraska and Texas, Oregon, California, then New York, and then in Chicago. And when we were in Chicago, we were in it. And, and, and um, there was a, uh, what was the strike? 
built. Um, it was the it was the the communications. There was a communications strike, um, so that there was not a lot of coverage of it. And 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 when I would come home, or when I came home and came back to Wilmer, the coverage that was there, people didn't believe what they were seeing. You know, that was like, oh, the media exaggerated what was going on. But, um, it, um, I mean, of course, with yeah, without, yeah. <laughs> but well. with, but without cell phones or anything, you know, we, we, we were just there, and um, and it, I, you know, they could say the whole world is watching, but I'm not really sure. It wasn't until later that the whole world was seeing. Um, but I wanted to just uh, talk about one, you know, personal incident, and I had mentioned that Jean's campaign headquarters was on the 15th floor of the Hilton Hotel. And um, it was reported that there were ashtrays or things that were being thrown from the 15th floor. They had designated that that's where it was. And this was Thursday. I think it was the night after Hubert had been given the nomination or the night of it. And um, so we were all sort of milling around there. Um, Gene wasn't on that floor. His suite was on a different floor. But these were sort of campaign people. And um, I was leaving to go to go to the elevator bank to push the for the elevator, and the elevator doors opened, and three elevators at one time opened, and it was a stampede of Chicago police that came with their batons drawn, and 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 it was one of those moments where you just cannot believe where you are and 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 of course there was hysteria because they came ready to to bludgeon and i still can remember um george kusenich i think was his name was one of the volunteers and i remember that billy club that wood hitting a skull and it's like a sound you never forget and and it just happened, you know, uh, it just, in, it was insanity. Um, and it was all pushed to a place, I think, as you were saying, where, where, where the, the country was, um, and, and that moment, and the war, and the city, and it all sort of came together. And unfortunately, it was in Richard Daly City where he said there will not be, you know, incidents here. And he had his he had his Chicago police primed, and, and it was something, I mean, I even forget about it, but now as I'm talking about it, you know, what, what it was, it's hard to believe. As the tanks were rolling into um, the streets of Prague, as the Russian tanks were rolling into the streets of Prague, um, the world was erupting. Um, the whole Algerian situation in France was exploding. Um, and, uh, you know, I wonder if social media because people can, you know, click with their thumbs. They don't get out in the streets in the same way. Um, they aren't forced to to sort of show up in the same way in the world of our today. Um, they protest via social media. Exactly, times, yeah. exactly. Sure, which it can be very well-meaning, maybe not, you know, quite as demonstrable, or, or certainly the optics are different, you know, right. for, the, for the networks. Um, a, a different kind of media question here, and I can remember, um, as a boy, uh, my father bringing this book home. Um, I have a dog-eared copy of it, which mm -hmm. became um, really a, a landmark bestseller called The Selling of the President, 1968. And it's things detailed, there are things detailed in here that everyone in this room um, might look at as almost amateurish now, or we, we take you know um, for granted that this is how politics is done, but it was truly revolutionary. Yes. And the revolution, for the most part, as detailed in this, was in the Nixon campaign mm -hmm. in terms of, of how effective they were. And I, I use this book a lot when I taught mass media and politics mm -hmm. here. And, and one of the, the quotes um, from Vice President Humphrey here was, he said, quote, the biggest mistake in my political life was not to learn how to use television, end quote. Mm -hmm. Later on, he said, I'm fighting package politics. It's an abomination for a man to place himself completely in the hands of the technicians, the ghost riders, the experts, the pollsters, and come out only as an attractive package, end quote. 
Judge Howard, talk a little bit, if you will, just you know your recollection of the campaign of, of the media environment, you know that, that that existed then, including some extraordinary commercials put together by the Nixon campaign, by a then young, unknown producer of the Mike, Michael Douglas show, by the name of Roger Ailes, mm -hmm. who we all mm -hmm. now know, before he recently passed, was the architect of, of Fox News, you know, mm -hmm. for so many years as well, and and. What kind of role did that play in the campaign from your recollection? Well, Nixon was afraid of the public. He did not want to appear in an uncontrolled or unstructured room. So he would have these town meetings with all invited guests and all people that had been screened, and he knew what the questions were going to be. Mm -hmm. Even the, and, but the media didn't um, really make a big deal out of that. But it was absolute package, package. And Hubert was a retail politician, and almost like a, a, a minister. I mean, he felt very deeply about moral issues, and he loved to talk. He absolutely loved to talk. But the media did play a role in 68, a positive role. Walter Cronkite, after the Tet Offensive, came on and expressed doubt about the Vietnam War. And that was the first, and he was a father figure in the media. I mean, he, it's, uh, I would have media, to say. Media, the country. The yeah. country, yeah. and the media, in general, was much more deferential to what we call the establishment in 68. It took them some time to wake up. I mean, now it's almost instantaneous, regardless of which side is unhappy. But when Cronkite came out, and then when you had um, Sandra Van Oker, and I can't remember all the names of the different people. Roger at Mudd. Roger Mudd. Roger Mudd. I mean, they witnessed a lot of the things, and they talked about on TV and made them real for the, real for the people, um, and no one, no one knew that Daly was going to be quite this um, strong-willed, um, crazy, or whatever, whatever adjective you want to give. But it was just as out of control as what was happening in '61 and '62 and '63 in the South, where the police just beat the living hell out of people. It was, it was a northern version of that. He, he took. Yes, there were people on the other side and that wanted to um, cause trouble, but he set the stage with what he did. But Nixon knew this. Nixon had been beaten by Kennedy in 60, and he learned some things. Kennedy was telegenic. Kennedy was, knew how to be scripted, knew how to control things. He had a very glamorous family. Um, it, was, it was called Camelot mm -hmm. in the 60s. And he decided to run again. And nobody thought he could win. The Republicans were in the process of um, developing the Southern strategy and um, basically appealing to um, more base interests. Um, and the media um, figured it out afterwards. But when he was doing it during 68, it was incredibly, incredibly effective. Because he wouldn't, and they controlled who was at the convention. They controlled, they had controlled the whole environment. And if you control the environment, then once you put it on a, in a little box, it all looks good. And he ran on law and order, and uh, Spiro Agnew, his candidate for vice president, had this to say about the media. They're the nattering nabobs of negativism. Right. <laughs> that, was, that was, and so what we're hearing now mm -hmm. from Trump in 2017 and 18, if you go back to Nixon, it was there then. Right. And um, Nixon won the 72 election, but he had this little problem in Watergate. <laughs> and he had the problem of the federal judiciary, just like we have now, mm -hmm. and US prosecutors. Um, and I don't know where it's going to end up, but to me, it's, uh, um, it's deja vu all over again, mm -hmm. as Yogi Berra says. Well, right. well indeed, let, let's explore that a, a little bit. And, and beyond the you know, nattering nabob of negativism parallel to Fake news, mm -hmm. which is you know the, yeah. the charge thrown at um, people in the press nowadays. Mm -hmm. President Trump, during his campaign, was the first candidate in half a century to openly embrace some of the language, if not some of the tactics of President Nixon, and said so before mm -hmm. the convention to the New York Times in, a, in mm -hmm. a striking interview, and invoked the phrases during his convention acceptance speech of law and order, which mm -hmm. of course was something that. Um, President Nixon focused on a lot, and the term that President Nixon used quite effectively, according to most political scientists, mm -hmm. the silent majority. And, and, and what kind of parallels you know, do, do you see 
over the half century ago. Okay, so well, I, 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 I'm, I'm reminded of Gene as he would reflect on the press. And um, he said in one interview that he really preferred sort of the Edward R. Murrow kind of interview where mm -hmm. you know he would speak, he would ask questions, and then he would take a puff on his cigarette, which gave people a moment to reflect on what had just been said or just been asked or just mm -hmm. been talked about. Um, Peter Yarrow um, tells this story um, of, of, of sitting with Jean and, um, and sort of asking him what he felt was, this was in 1991, the sort of single issue of concern facing America today. And Jean said, as Peter said, stupidity. Mm -hmm. That we are a country, um, a, a nation that is um, informationally intelligent, but we are very quickly losing the capacity for considered thought. And that was, that was a modus operandi of Gene McCarthy, considered thought. And he said, distraction is our biggest enemy. And he holds the press responsible for that. Mm -hmm. And um, that this sense of there's no time to reflect on an issue. There's no time to give it some, some real thought and let it sink in. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that, um, you know, I think he would be sort of quite horrified by the way in which even the press on the left is, is it, it, it just doesn't stop to give people a chance. Bill Moyers mm -hmm. would certainly do that. I think Judy Woodworth and some of the, mm -hmm. the you know, the, the, um, the NewsHour people take a little more time to do that. But I, I think it's a real problem that we have. In 68, to the chagrin and the frustration of Gene's um, press campaign, he wouldn't do one minute spots. For the California primary, he bought a half an hour on ABC from 7 to 7.30. You could tune in to hear what it was that he had to say and what he felt. And he talked for a half an hour looking at the camera. And they said, but you need to cover all the networks, but you need to, they said, he said, no, I, you know, I can't talk in sound bites. If people want to know in California what it is I think, I'm on ABC from 7 to 7.25. And that was sort of a way in which he used his campaign money. By the way, the average soundbite, as most recently measured, is about eight seconds mm -hmm. now on network television, just to give some contrast here. And you showed some footage in, in your documentary, and of course, you know, one of the um, incredibly searing and striking and saddening moments of 1968 took place in California, mm -hmm. um, in Los Angeles, and, and it was um, the assassination of Senator Robert Kennedy, and mm -hmm. I want to know if both of you could share from your perspective and also how you saw it through your uncles, mm -hmm. his entry in the race and how that changed them and how his assassination um, was felt personally by them. Well, I know that Hubert talked to both Gene and also to Robert Kennedy, and before Kennedy died, there was a, there was a way they were going to try to have a convention that was sane, mm -hmm. and it all went up in smoke. Um, because Kennedy had very bad relationship with Johnson. Johnson and he did not get along, but uh, Hubert and Jean and got along. And Hubert, the campaign turned after the Salt Lake City speech where Humphrey said, I want to negotiate. Mm -hmm. And Johnson had been threatening him, but then didn't, didn't did disown him and cut him off from the money. But it, it was, um, it was all a jumble. It happened so quickly because the convention was at the end of August. It was mm -hmm. like state fair week. Mm -hmm. And then the election is a bank, a, a essentially nine weeks. And it, Hubert was down at 30% at one point. And it was just, um, it, he was, it was getting better um, at the end, but um, there was some shenanigans that if, have been in the paper between uh, Nixon and Anna Chenault and other people that were negotiating with the North 
North Vietnamese, telling him, you'll get a better deal from Nixon, don't talk to Humphrey, right. and don't, don't cave in, because Johnson wanted to end the war. He wanted, that was one of his goals. He, he saw the light, because he, he basically fell apart the last two years um, and was um, a mental wreck. Um, but it didn't happen because um, Nixon intervened and Humphrey was told about it and he didn't make it public because he didn't, there wasn't, the president didn't say how they got this information or who had it. And it was basically wiretaps by the CIA. Mm -hmm. But that would have, <laughs> how, how do you release that to the public? Yeah. But Haldeman's notes have, and Ehrlichman's notes have now come out and he did, and he did tell people to do these things. But if you want to now compare corruption, Spiro Agnew had to resign because he was receiving payoffs from the food fair food chain um, in Philadelphia. He would get $600 or $800 a week and they'd free groceries. They'd bring it to him when he was vice president. He had to resign for out and out graft. So this business of graft is not new. Um, and in Maryland, um, politics was somewhat like Illinois. It was, um, there was kind of a machine atmosphere and he was county executive um, and he, um, if you wanted to get an exception to the zoning code so you could build your factory along the beltway, you had to give certain money. That's the way it worked in Maryland. And they had zoned the entire beltway as parkland, but <laughs> it's not parkland mm -hmm. if you go on it now. Um, so the, the corruption that we have is now, but if we don't have a free media and we don't respect the media, this whole thing falls apart because the media is kind of the loyal opposition. Mm -hmm. when, when Johnson's in, they're on Johnson. When Nixon's in, they're on Nixon. When Trump's in, they're on Trump. When Hillary was running, they were, they were after her and everybody complains about it. But that's their job. Mm -hmm. They're not, they're Caesar's wife. They're not here for one side or the other. Mm. The only thing I would say is 68 and now, the media were much more accommodating to um, to the political elite, let's let's call it that, because Gene's crusade was basically, oh, these are a bunch of college students. Um, this isn't serious. Well, it did get serious, but it, but we were still in that war. How many people died after '68? Well, there, there had been fifteen thousand American mm -hmm. soldiers that had died until '68, and thirty-five thousand more died from. Um, 69 to 74, 75. Um, and that doesn't take into account the suicides mm -hmm. that have happened. There have been about 50,000 casualties of soldiers who came home and a million Vietnamese people died in that six years after Nixon was elected. And you know, there was, I just, we did an interview with Walter Mondale recently for the film and Walter was talking about this idea of trying at the convention of bringing this fractured mm -hmm. Democratic Party back together again. And they had really worked out what they thought was um, um, a reasonable compromise mm -hmm. where it dealt with, you know, with the, with the anti-war activists, with the Humphrey people, with the Kennedy people, um, and they sent it on to Washington, mm -hmm. to the White House, mm -hmm. and Lyndon said, absolutely not, he just, he just said, "No, we're not. We're not. We are. We're not going in the direction of any kind of resolution about the war um, out of out of Chicago." And and mm -hmm. and and Walter felt very saddened by it because he saw then, boom, that that you know the the party was going to go into the election divided. And I know that the Democrats that and I, this is the case certainly in Minnesota because. Mm -hmm. Minnesota was Hubert Humphrey's state. I mean, it was Gene McCarthy's too, but Hubert Humphrey was Minnesota's heart and soul. And, um, and Gene withheld his endorsement for Hubert after Chicago. Um, I think he was hoping that Hubert would come out more as in opposition to the war. Um, and, but I think Hubert also knew that he had to pay attention to allegiance to Johnson because Johnson still held the purse strings and still held a certain kind of power. Um, and it wasn't until two weeks before the election that Gene finally said, I will throw my, I will vote for Hubert Humphrey. You know, I, I think that Hubert, in, you know, 
terms of what he's talking about, as far as the war is concerned, is more closely aligned to um, a continuation of the war, but that his, his domestic policies, he knew that Hubert had a real foundation and that it would be better for the country. Um, and he, because the Democratic Party left Chicago without a peace plank mm -hmm. in the platform, Gene felt it was unconscionable, actually, to throw his support, to say, okay, fellas, you know, and mm -hmm. ladies, you know, now, okay, it's over, and um, I'll just be a good Democrat. He, 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 couldn't, he couldn't do that. But what he did do that I think was interesting was he wrote a letter when he endorsed Hubert saying he would not run for re-election, that he did not want people to think that by his endorsing Hubert, he was trying to get in the good graces. And I think he also, I think he also wanted, I think he saw himself doing other things outside of the Senate. And, um, and I think he, he, he wanted to, um, well, he, he, he wanted to support Hubert, but also not have it be seen as, as a way of, we would love to get your participation in the conversation, so any and all who have questions, um, I think we can probably hear everyone, or we can uh, bring a microphone up there, but if anyone has any questions, um, please jump in. And, uh, and while we're, oh, please, please, yes. Vietnam vet, okay. And um, I, I see the problem with um, academics, basically. You know, the basic training for people is that, um, you know, you break them down, then you build them up. Okay, so you person wants to be a doctor, you know, you give them eight, ten years of training from uh, age 18 or so, and um, therefore, at the end, they, they got such a big ego, for example, it's only recently they've been accepting alternative medication, okay? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Same with lawyers. You sit uh, outside of a law school, they're not taught what the law is, they're taught how to get around it, okay? Mm -hmm. And so uh, with politicians, with business people, you know, they're taught, uh, basically they're brainwashed, okay? And so by the time they get into their 30s, they are so entrenched upon their ideas, you can't change it. And so basically the violence occurs when uh, people aren't listening. They're so brainwashed, um, 1964, we had an information officer that came around. Why are we here in Vietnam? Half of us, th there was only probably 10, 12,000 Americans in the country at the time, maybe 100 people in this particular meeting. He tried to tell us why we were there. Half of us said, you know, we really don't belong here. The other half said, oh, bring in the Marines and whatnot. And so, um, but of course, the, the military didn't listen and that's what happened. Um, I just want to say that the, um, you know, here we are an academic here. Uh, whoever came up with domino theory, duh, <laughs> didn't work very good. You know, it's a big mistake. Thank you very much for your comment. And, and if either of you want to comment on that, um, um, what was said, please feel free to, to jump in. So. Um, I think there's a book that kind of capsulizes. It's called The Best and the Brightest by David Halperstam. Mm -hmm where he, um, there were some very significant academic people in the Kennedy administration, um, and they came up with not, th the domino theory had been around earlier, but they, um, they, were, they convinced Johnson um, that escalating the war was the only way. I don't know that Johnson wouldn't have gone that way. He, he, was, he was in, the, in a 50s mode uh, at the time, but Clearly, we've learned some things from, from that. Uh, that. That book really opened my eyes. Mm -hmm. um, Robert McNamara had all these spreadsheets and bullet points and everything about how we were going to win the war, um, but it didn't happen. Um, and there's some, there are a lot of movies about it. And McNamara got, got out, and they, Johnson gave him the world to be the head of, I think, the World Bank. But... Um, he never really sort of got it. Um, it's not, you have to decide what you're gonna go to war for, 
and you've got to analyze what you need. And we didn't. Um, the Vietnamese were not the Chinese, and the Chinese um, threatened the Vietnamese, and we thought they were monolithic with the Russians, and it wasn't true. The Vietnamese have been conquered by the Chinese several times, and there's, um, there's a lot of enmity between them, but we didn't factor that in or learn from that. Um, and if we look at our current wars, we're doing the same thing. George Bush the first decided to get out of Iraq and not try to occupy the country. He just take Kuwait back. He had a limited objective. The last war in Iraq has no limited objectives, and we're still there, and we're in Afghanistan too. Um, and we've got soldiers in 19 countries um, in Africa fighting ISIS. But, you know, we've got to decide there's sort of a tension in this country about what, what the goals are for, for democracy. And it's going to be up to you folks to change some of those goals if we're going to survive. You mentioned the enmity between Vietnam and China. And, of course, there was tremendous enmity between the Soviet Union and China at the mm -hmm. time. And that was not factored in as well. Other questions? Hi. Um, it seems to be a strand of, you know, the World War II was the unanimous kind of like everybody got behind it. I don't, I, you were talking about Korea. I don't know too much about that. But ever since Vietnam, the 60s, there's been, and it has a lot to do with the draft and, and later all volunteers, but, you know, now we've got a series of presidents that have avoided the draft, mm -hmm. and there's a pretty big split in the country between, you know, the educated elite and uh, other people that, uh, you know, the Clinton campaign was marginalized or, or didn't know existed, who voted for Trump. So do you guys have any kind of comments on that? or? Uh, yeah, uh, um, I happened to tune in last night to Chris Hayes, um, who was with Michael Moore in Flint, Michigan. And if any of you can go on demand and, and watch it, it's really, it's really worth a watch. Um, because what is happening there is that people are realizing that in order to make changes, they have to be a part of the change. And uh, school teachers who are running for Congress and water activists who are running. Um, and I think that's really what the Jean McCarthy campaign uh, was about on another prong. It, certainly it was against the war, but um, there's, a, there's something that I just would love to read from a book that Gene wrote in 1969. It was called The Year of the People, and it was a, his book about that campaign. And in the last paragraph from the introduction, he writes, if one were to characterize the year 1968 in the way the, which the Chinese marked the years, the year of the horse, the year of the dragon, from a political point of view, 1968 would have to be called the year of the people. For it was the year in which the people, in so far as the systems and the process would permit, asserted themselves and demonstrated their willingness to make hard political judgments and to take full responsibility of those judgments. And in so doing, they acted with more spirit and more commitment than did many political leaders. And I think that's a parallel where we find ourselves today, that um, I think that it is these women and men who are deciding to run for city council or to run for Congress and are doing well because um, there's a resonance, there's a, there is a frustration um, between this sort of non-working republic and the people who are who are running it and those who want to make a difference. And I think that those were the people, some of those people Trump spoke to, they were awakened lions. Um, but 
But I think we bear a responsibility, you know, too, in not, not being out there and being willing to look at this and to make hard judgments and to step forward. There's a reason why, a you know, the population of people in this country don't vote. And uh, some of them have given up. Some of them aren't interested. Um, and, and, and I think somehow or another that's what the focus has to be is to try and give uh, meat and tissue that where people can, can connect and, and become a part of it in some way. I think that there's a parallel to 68. That was a tumultuous year. Mm -hmm. The previous eight years of our recession, a lot of people got hurt. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the populace, whatever you want to call it, there's resentment. Why did we bail out the bankers? Right. But we didn't help anybody like Roosevelt did. They went and refinanced most of the houses that were being foreclosed in 35, 36, 37. They didn't do anything to help the people. They only helped the bankers. And a lot of people are still hurting from that. And so they lose faith in Washington and they have anger. And Trump comes along and says, I have a simple solution. Just listen to me. Mm -hmm. um, we had this before under Roosevelt, but Huey Long was assassinated and Father Coughlin was recalled by the Vatican. So we've had demagogues before, but demagogues come along when there's a fertile field. And we have a fertile field because there are a lot of people that feel the government doesn't care about them and only cares about Wall Street. And if we don't, I mean, I think Obama was a great president, but I think it was a very ser serious mistake not to help Main Street, but just to help Wall Street. And that, and that, if you look at the people who voted for Trump, there's anger and distrust at the core of their beliefs. Is Trump giving them what they want? I don't think so, but he's a result of the country having the most severe economic dislocation since the Great Depression. Dislocation, that's a very, very good word, yep. So both of your uncles lost in 1968 in similar, similar capacities. I'm wondering how each of them took that loss to motivate them moving forward from that experience. I actually went back to teach him. He taught at McAllister and at the University of Minnesota for two years, then ran for Senate. And he was able to get through the Humphrey Hawkins bill mm -hmm. in the 70s before he died of cancer, which was made the Federal Reserve Board look at employment and not just inflation in setting interest rates. Um, the Republicans want to do away with that, but we, it's still the law. And he, he died of cancer, um, and it was tragic, but that's, you know, that's life. McCarthy had a long, but it was very hard. He was depressed for a while. Mm -hmm. Very, I mean, I, but he got out of it by mix, getting back with the students, and he wanted his memorial to be the Humphrey School, which is. Mm -hmm. he, didn't want, he didn't want a big building or anything like that. He wanted, and the Humphrey School, I'm on the advisory board, <laughs> um, does wonderful things and has lots of programs, and I would encourage all of you to take a class or two there. I took one when I was a judge and I was running family court. I took a class on leadership for the common good and how do you, how do you bring people together, how do you decide to lead, and that's the fountain of democracy, is teaching people how to m impact their communities, whatever the community may be. Um, well, he, um, he, he had as many years outside of um, uh, the system as he did in it. And um, he, he ran for president is in three other elections um, in trying to challenge the two-party system, trying to challenge the debate system. He, to the, you know, the, that only the two major candidates would be qualified for debate. He took issues to the Supreme Court. Um, he, he taught graduate courses at, at the New School. Um, and, uh, but some of these, ideas that he fought and challenged and tried to change, um, a lot of people didn't understand and they sort of considered him, uh, you know, a gadfly in some ways. And, um, but, but I think, I believe, 
as I'm listening to Jean talk and more and more and more, um, there, there was a profound belief that he had of committing one's life in service to. And, um, and I think that it came from his Benedictine roots um, and it stayed with him. And he, he stayed committed to fostering these ideas even when he didn't have the kind of audience that he had in 1968. He wrote books. Um, and he tried as as he could to bring attention to um, to people. You may not like this comparison, but I think Bernie Sanders is mm -hmm. kind of a latter day Gene McCarthy, and his bill to basically take some corruption out of the government, allowing senators not allowing them to um, work for law firms afterwards, and letting mm -hmm. staff work for law firms and and get money out of politics, mm -hmm. is a continuation mm -hmm. of. Um, where McCarthy was. So, I mean, these people come along at various points in time. And if you read what Sanders is saying now, he's basically saying we have to reinvent democracy mm -hmm. or we're done. Right. Do you agree with that? I, well, I, I, I think in some ways, yes, it's a comparison. And, and there was something that Bernie brought to the forefront. There was a reason why there was this groundswell. Mm -hmm you know, of young people, but not just young people, environmentalists, I mean, there, as, as in Jean's campaign, you know, people said it was the children's crusade, but, but there, you know, there were anti-war mm -hmm. activists who were not young people that a candidate came along. Bobby Hanman says, you know, there he was, and we finally had somebody from 1964 to 1968, they were opposed to the war. And I mean, yes, I, I do think, I think Bernie is talking about uh, universal health care, which is um, universal basic income, which was something that Gene had talked about thinking we needed to at least open a debate on, universal health care. It was something that Hubert and Gene were, you know, debating in the Senate in 1948. And um, that there, there are a lot of these issues that relate, I think, to folks that, that, that you know, Bernie really is, is speaking of, and there's a reason why he's galvanized. Um, but I think, you know, I think the left came at it just differently than the right. Um, the right was Trump and, the, and, mm -hmm. and his answer, but I don't think the Democrats took Hillary. Hillary did not take it seriously. She picked a running mate who was kind of a carbon copy of herself mm -hmm. rather than trying to pick somebody from the other wing of the party. And, but there's another comparison that the McGovern reforms were basically the McCarthy reforms that made we have primaries now. In 68, there mm -hmm. maybe were 15 or 20 states that had primaries and the rest were all picked by caucuses and a lot of them were controlled by political bosses. The doing away with superdelegates is a further reform and that is, I would say, as a result of Bernie Sanders which means that all of the delegates are going to be picked by the people and not whether they're elected officials to decide who the nominee is going to be. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, thanks very much for the panel. Uh, my name is Brian Horrigan. I was a curator of the 1968 exhibit at the Minnesota History Center, and which is uh, on view again. It uh, has been all year. It will be on view until January. It's a little plug. Uh, mm -hmm get over to the History Center to see it, where I have retired from, so I don't need to plug it anymore, but um, youth culture is the first two words of the panel, and I wanted to, to sort of drill down on that a little bit, because in doing research for the, for the exhibit um, some years ago now, we came across a Gallup poll, which is pretty well known actually, from 1968, that showed that support for the war was strongest among the 18 to 35-year-old Democrats and was uh, the weakest among the 35 to, let's say, 55 or 60-year-olds. In other words, people who had experienced World War II <laughs> knew they did, we didn't want to be involved in another war, another foreign war. Um, youth, however, more strongly supported the war than their parents did. Mm -hmm. And this, is, this goes against all of the sort of stereotypes of the youth of America uh, that was out on the streets of Chicago. That was a very relatively small percentage of the youth of America. That was me. Um, that I, you know, a, a white, educated, urban, um, relatively elite, um, 
middle class, college going, uh, that, that left out a whole lot of youth uh, culture. That left out a whole lot of America who, was, uh, who were young people. So I just wondered if you wanted to talk about that. Yeah, you saw it in Madison, Wisconsin, a good documentary on the, the rioting that took place in Madison, Wisconsin, and the disconnect between the young police officers and the students, and the students' um, views. And that, I, I think that still exists today in the state. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. Yeah. You should, everybody, you should see it, because yeah, it was sort of the middle part of the um, uh, the anti-war movement. The other part of the anti-war movement we haven't talked about is where the National Guard shot people at Kent State. Mm -hmm. And all they were doing was demonstrating. They were not trying to hurt anybody or do anything. So you get people that are trained one way and the opposition, and it takes a long time to sort it out. It doesn't, um, I'm, I hope that we're beginning to wake up and that people are running to things because we need change. I think that's happening, but I encourage everybody to vote mm -hmm. because it's the people that don't vote that sometimes bring us the worst things. So everybody in here should register. You can, all you need is your driver's license and your university ID. If you have a different address than that and you go and you vote and you can register on the day um, of the election in Minnesota, which is rare. We're doing voter suppression in Wisconsin. The Wisconsin students cannot vote, could not vote in Madison if they lived, if their home was somewhere else. But people that had guns and had deer permits and fishing licenses could register and vote wherever they wanted. And that was brought mm -hmm. to us by our Wisconsin governor. It's been in court. I'm not sure where it is now. But the voter suppression um, is not just in the South yeah. or in funny places. Um, Ohio just, and it was upheld by the Supreme Court less than three months ago, allowed, pe if people did not vote for four years, mm. um, and that a lot of people only vote in presidential elections, they're perched from the rolls in Ohio. Wow. And that is, you know, Ohio's a great, and that was upheld on a 5-4 vote. And that's why who's in the judiciary really matters. Yes, um, they were saying last night on the Michael Moore, on his Chris Matthews piece, that the students who were saying that if they were at Lansing to vote and they lived in um, the Upper Peninsula, it was a it was an eight hour drive to get to the polling places that they they couldn't they couldn't vote at, at universities. We have time for one more question. Please. Okay, I will finish this off then. I'm wondering what each of you think was unique about Minnesota politics at the time that really resonated with the rest of the country that two of our major major presidential candidates were from Minnesota. And if you think there's anything unique about Minnesota politics right now that could also, you know, be of interest to the rest of the country and how, how we lift that up. I have to defer to you, Bill, because I'm not really a Minnesota. There's a good book by Theodore Neufeld, who's mm -hmm. a professor at um, McAllister, and I took, he's a guest professor, I took political science with him. We have the combination of the state capitol here, the business center, and the university. And unlike Iowa, we have a restless proletariat of laborers, whether they're in St. Paul or on the Iron Rail. Mm -hmm. And by getting them together, until 1948, they weren't together. Mm -hmm. But you had the intellectuals from the university working with the labor unions. Hubert came out of the university. And his, his campaign people were, many of them were union workers, but many of them were also young um, elected, um, young PhDs and other things mm -hmm. um, from the university. I think it's the nature of the culture in Minnesota. Um, we have the highest voter turnout usually in the country. Um, we have the best laws. Um, it's something in the water. <laughs> In the 10,000 lakes, right? No, I mean, it, it, it is different. I grew up in Maryland, mm -hmm. and I can tell you that Maryland's a very different state than Minnesota. It's mm -hmm. much more like Illinois, machine politics. Think here. We have a large legislature, which means that the people that run for the legislature can walk their districts in the urban areas mm -hmm. and get elected without a lot of money. Politics is still open in Minnesota, and it's becoming more and more closed and a result of money, but you can still run... Um, and win. There was a, 
example, in Eaton Prairie, last election, a high school teacher of civics or something ran, and he beats the incumbent Republican woman by going door to door to door mm -hmm. to door. And that happens all over Minnesota. Uh, Minneapolis is much more politicized than other parts of the metropolitan area, but there's plenty of politics around here to get involved in. If you're interested in water, if you're interested in mining, you can get any issue you want, and there's a group 